Welcome to the Divorce Survival Guide podcast, where we have open and honest conversations about co-parenting, separation, divorce, and the hardest question of all, should you stay or should you go? I'm Kate Anthony, your Divorce Survival Guide, and I'm here to help you navigate some of the roughest waters you've ever swum in and answer some of your toughest questions. I've been to hell and back, and now it's my mission in life to help you get to the other side of this process with your sanity and your heart intact. Hey everyone, welcome back. I'm super excited about our episode today. I brought back my dear friend, Susan Guthrie, who I'm always, always thrilled to talk to. Um, Any excuse to talk to Susan. Um, And we're talking about all things high conflict and the legal in the legal sense. We do a lot of conversations about high conflict um, relationships and divorce and all sorts of stuff from the emotional aspect on this show. But I wanted to talk about some of the legal stuff because I get so many questions. Um, And so much of what people talk about legally just doesn't apply to so many of you. So um, I wanted to ask the expert, <laughs> and so I did. Um, and just a uh, just a, a quick one more plug. We start Grit and Grace next week. We already have an amazing lineup of women. Um, we do still have a couple spots available. So um, if you're interested in Grit and Grace, please head over to my website, kateanthony.com. Uh, click on coaching and you will find everything you need to know about my group program that is starting on September 15th. And uh, it's a, it's rolling enrollment. So you can join at any time. If you miss the deadline, if you're listening to this sometime in the next month or so, when you're like, oh shit, don't worry about it. That's the beauty of grit and grace is that people can start anytime. And that's it. Let's just dive into my conversation with Susan because it's awesome. Susan, thank you so much for coming on and answering some legal Q and A's for us, some tough ones. Yeah, well, and anytime I get a chance to spend a little time with you, Kate, I'm happy to do it. But I'm also this is an area where I know your uh, listeners really want some direction, so I'm really happy to be able to hopefully help here. Yes, I so appreciate it. Yes, and and um, it was a it was a selfish call. It was a. It was a, hey, you want to come on my podcast so that we can hang out for a while? <laughs> exactly. You'll be getting a call from me shortly. So <laughs> I want to sort of preface this conversation a little bit that I want to try and keep, I want to try and keep some focus on some of the more high conflict situations because when we talked about this b- beforehand, but I'm letting them know, um, because, you know, it's one thing to have legal advice, Right that like most people in my groups and my followers, my listeners are like, yeah, but that doesn't apply to me because I'm dealing with like a narcissist with an abuser, with somebody who's got like, you know, narcissistic personality disorder, someone who's like basically his entire MO is out to get me. Right. And so it's really complicated because they, the, the, the regular legal answers don't necessarily apply. Right. And, And that's very true. And it's incredibly frustrating um, for people because most practitioners and, and I'll say attorneys and, and uh, everybody in, in the field, you know, we're so used to giving the, you know, rote legal answers. Cause that's what we fall back on. That's what the law is. And reality is a lot of the, that basic stuff that gives guidelines to the rest of the world doesn't really put rails up around narcissists and high conflict people. Right. And it's really, uh, it's challenging. Yes. It's really, which is why yeah, I think people are struggling and looking for information and find, you know, your podcast and, and some of our other colleagues out there because you are focusing in on a very particular group, uh, that have gone beyond just two people who can't get along very well and have really gone into that realm of there's at least one person who's going to do everything they can to work outside the boundaries of the law, right? Yeah. The law is not able to rein them in. Right, right. And you said something really interesting to, uh, that I said 
uh, before we hit record, you said something interesting to me that I was like, you're going to have to say that all that again, once we hit record. So can you say all that again? (laughs) Remember what it was? (laughs) I do. I do. Because this is such a common situation for the professionals, right? Like now I'm going to talk from our side of the fence, somebody who daily has worked for years, trying to help people going through the divorce process with a high conflict individual. And the reality is, is we're no more magic than you are. And by you, I mean the person who's stuck in that high conflict relationship or that divorce. No one taught us and there is no real magic formula. Bill Eddy, I love you. You know, I mean, <laughs> that's a Biff, formula. Yes. Yeah, that's a formula and it will work within certain constructs and in certain situations, but there is no magic wand or formula that will magically change a a narcissistic or high conflict person into behaving properly. So it is an ongoing, frustrating, difficult process for everyone involved. The tools do not exist in the legal system for, for attorneys or the court system to change that bad behavior to person. We, they can be punished and they can be like, you know, reined in hopefully if they're, if they're even recognized, right. Because exactly. So, you know, that's part of it, of course, is, is, is recognizing them. Um, and I think, I think that's a really interesting uh, going back to bill Eddie for a second. Cause it, cause Biff is right. It's not a magic. It's not going to make them not abuse you. It's not, but what it is going to do is protect you is, is do everything in your power to protect yourself. Right. And if anybody doesn't know what we're talking about, we're talking about Bill Eddy, Biff, Biff for co-parent communication, which is a book that needs to be on all of your bookshelves. Um, Susan and I both have had Bill Eddy on our podcasts. So listen, uh, go back and, and find those episodes because, um, Biff stands for brief, informative, friendly, and firm. And it, you, Take it away, Susan. Talk about what sort of what what does Biff provide for co-parent communication? Yeah, and and it's truly it's a tool, and I love the way that you phrased it. It is a way to protect yourself, right? Nothing about Biff is going to change the communication style of your high conflict person. And that we all know everyone out there who's listening, you know the communication style of a high conflict person. It's it's abusive. It's um, constant. It's you know epic. long, epic, epic right? <laughs> and, and, and what happens is you get caught up in that communication circle cycle, right? They throw a lot of blah at you. That was what. That's a legal phrase, by that's the way. That's a legal blah. Yeah. <laughs> and and your first response as a human being is to defend yourself to point out all the ways they're wrong. And so you, you write a novel back to them and all you really do is then perpetuate that conflict cycle. So Biff is giving you a way to respond to an ongoing behavior of your high conflict person that takes you outside of the conflict cycle. It's not going to necessarily stop their onslaught. It's going to stop your participation in it. Yes. 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 Because what I like to think of is like these communications, these like high conflict, you know, epic emails and stuff like that. Those are, that's a fishing line that's just been like thrown out. And the second you answer all the questions and get all the way involved, blah, 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 you have bit the hook. You've mm-hmm. bit the hook and it is embedded in your cheek and you're going to be hell bent. You're going to be hard pressed to get it out. So Biff is a way for you to kind of sidestep the hook, right? Swim by the hook and not get it. Um, have I beaten that metaphor to death yet? Yeah, no, <laughs> and, but it's such a good one. And and I like actually, because the hook hurts, gosh darn it. Yeah. And so does, you know, so does being dragged through that ongoing, I call it the hamster wheel of conflict, right? The, mm-hmm. the they throw something at you, you throw something back that's well-meaning and factual and correct and truthful and all those bizarre things. And then they come back at you with more blah, to use my legal phrase, right? Right. It will never stop. And so the only way to protect yourself is to take yourself out of that. And that's what brief and formative, friendly, but firm can do, That's right. but it will not change 
that high conflict person. That's what I, I think all of the tools we can give people and all of the tools that attorneys can learn, mediators can learn, judges can learn. They're all managing a high conflict person or that particular incident of that high conflict person. Yeah. Nothing's going to change that that high conflict person will go on and continue to be high conflict. That's right. That is who they are. When we were talking about this before, you said something like, you know, they have sort of bamboozled you all of this time. And right there, they've been high conflict with you all of this time and you haven't been able to stop it. There's nothing that a lawyer, like lawyers are not, they're not magicians. I guess you've said this, but they're not magicians. They're not going to be able to be like, you, you stop that. (laughs) Well, yeah, (laughs) like you cut that out right now. First of all, everybody thinks like lawyers have some sort of authority. Lawyers have no authority. We are people with a certain skill set and knowledge that we learned, but the only people who have authority are judges. And they didn't, as one of my favorite judges said in court, in open court, it's in a transcript somewhere. I'm sorry, ma'am. The robe didn't come with a magic wand, (laughs) right? (laughs) And I love him still. Um, and, And he's not wrong, right? There's, again, it goes back to that. We cannot, there's nothing about the court system, the legal process or the laws that changes someone. It's just a management tool. And the thing about high conflict people, and your your listeners know this if they're in that relationship, high conflict people are unmanageable. And so it's a constant struggle. Right. And and not only are they unmanageable, they, I mean, they are unmanageable and also they don't want to be managed. So as soon as you start managing them, they're gonna start, they're gonna start escalating. So, yeah. you know, it's and 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 these people, by the way, speaking of attorneys not having authority, if if your high conflict partner doesn't do or soon to be ex partner doesn't do what their attorney is advising, they will likely go through many, 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 many attorneys. And this process will be dragged out even longer because their attorneys are going to fire. Them. So you've got, there are usually two options, right? One is they, they're a, their attorney becomes very sort of insistent about their behavior. And so they fire their attorney because they don't like what their attorney's telling them to do or th- right. that their attorney's like, yeah, you actually are not entitled to that. It's not going to work that way. I'm going to fire my attorney because he's not getting me what I want. Or the attorney's like, well, you're not listening to me. So I'm out. <laughs> right. Right. There's a very high profile divorce going on in the news right now where someone who potentially is a high conflict personality is on their sixth, I think, or seventh attorney in the case. Mm -hmm. And for the vast majority of the attorneys who have left this case on his behalf, they have filed a motion to withdraw as his attorney based upon irretrievable breakdown or irreconcilable differences with their client. It's, It's almost the same thing, like why people file for divorce. They're basically saying, I'm giving my client legal advice, good advice, and my client refuses to listen to me. Or worse, a client who actually lies to their attorney or lies, gets caught lying to other people. I've had that case. I had a a couple of instances where a client bald face lied to me, to my face, and or to the court on the stand and then got caught. And you know, an attorney really has no choice under those circumstances. You you cannot perpetuate. We have ethics or right. ethical rules. We can't help perpetuate a lie. Yep. All right. So all that being said, <laughs> that we do not have, uh, you don't have magical powers. Your attorney doesn't have magical powers. Can you, here's a question that I had actually came up on my community call this morning. Can you, and this is about mediation. And you are the mediation queen. For those who don't know, I don't know why, how you would not know this, but Susan actually trains mediators how to mediate. So <laughs> she's, she is the expert. Can you mediate with someone who is actively lying and hiding assets and like literally not coming to the table with any uh, collaborative intent? So... Maybe. Or I mean, I hate you, to. How do you address it with the meeting, right. right? Like, what do you do? So there has to be, I mean, 
a part of any divorce process. It does not matter whether you're collaborative, mediative, litigation, you know, negotiation. There first has to be the sharing of information. It's a standard part. In, in fact, in the state you're in, Kate, and in most states, um, it's a it's a requirement, right? right? But you get people who just do everything they can, and certainly high conflict people um, who just will not give forth that information willingly. Mm -hmm. So it becomes one of the first issues in a mediation that needs to be mediated instead of everybody willingly coming to the table in the mediation to give their information. The first issue you need to talk about is what information is required and where is it and why isn't it being brought to the table? And the high conflict person has to be invested enough in the process for whatever reason, and we, and we can talk about why they might want to be in mediation, mm -hmm. but they have to have enough self-interest to want to stay in mediation. So it has to become a part of the process that it is discussed. The person who feels that they're not getting information has to hold a line and a negotiation has to happen about how that information is going to come about. Yeah. Or the threat is it then has to go back to court. And that's not a good thing for either side of that fence, but you have to tie it into, and I talk about this all the time, high conflict people have reasons why they want to go to mediation. They are very likely not the same reasons you want to go to mediation. And a mistake that almost every person makes is thinking, well, I want a, a amicable divorce. I want to have a less toxic divorce or our kids do well. They think those are the reasons why the high conflict personality is there. That absolutely has nothing to do with why they are there. And you need to acknowledge that and understand what their incentives are so that you then can remind that or make that a subtle part of the conversation. And it's usually things like saving money, saving face. Actually, that's a big one. Big one. Big one. Especially with our narcissists, right? right? They want to look like a good person who to the outside world, well, I'm trying to mediate with her. We're in mediation, but they've got to be in mediation to be able to say that. So um, whatever that incentive is, a lot of them also think that they can manipulate the mediator and that they can manipulate you more easily in a mediated setting mm -hmm. as opposed to a courtroom where there's actually someone who has authority, mm -hmm. right? A judge finally has authority. So it does happen. There are a variety of different ways to deal with the issue. Another possibility to just want to make sure people understand this is many people think that when they're in the mediation, they don't have an attorney helping them or supporting them. Oh, thank you. And Please you address know, this. <laughs> right? Well, this is because this is really yeah. critical. Over and over and over again. Yes. Yeah. I mean, this is really a critical aspect because this is one, a reason why many people don't choose mediation, right? Well, I can't go into mediation. I don't know anything about the law. You don't need to, right? There's <laughs> professionals that are there to help you through this. Or they think, well, the mediator will tell me what I'm supposed to do. Or the mediator will tell you, tell me what I'm legal. What's about. fair. What's fair. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's not and, a and job. It is not a mediator's job. Even a mediator like me, who's an attorney and knows the law, I can't give you legal advice because I'm your neutral mediator. But every couple that I work with, whether they're high conflict or not, or that I have worked with, I highly recommend that they have consulting attorneys throughout the process. And when it's a high conflict divorce, it's a necessity. Absolutely. Frankly, it's just a necessity. Right. Yes. Um, so, so explain the difference for people who don't know, like what does a, what does a consulting attorney do and how do they differ from your mediator or an attorney that you're, you're working with? Who's litigating, litigating for you or. Right. Mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, so a consulting attorney is really a, an as needed resource and support for the individuals going through divorce. So your mediator, and again, many mediators do have a legal background. Many of us have, are still practicing attorneys in, in some jurisdictions, but a mediator's role is to be neutral. 
that's a, a critical part of it, right? They're supporting both parties with understanding the process, what the issues are, a general understanding of the law in a neutral sense, but then to really explore the different ways that all these puzzle pieces can get moved around, right? But the law has an impact on the decisions you might be making. And it's completely understandable that you may want to ask an expert, a lawyer, what a good path for you would be or what the the right advice might be legally about certain issues. And when it comes down to very legal issues like discovery, which is what you're talking about in the sharing of information, the sharing of the financials, that is something that attorneys completely understand, right? They know the rules. There are rules around discovery. As I said earlier, you know, there's laws. It's it's part of the process that there has to be certain discovery. And so that's a conversation that an attorney on your behalf can introduce into the process in a way that your mediator cannot. Your mediator can say, well, Bob, Mary's telling us that if you won't give over the bank statements for the last three years, she doesn't think she can go forward with the mediation. Can you see any way, Bob, that you can meet that need on Mary's part, right? Or And Bob will say, no, I don't think she's entitled to them. I'm not going to give them to them. People think the mediator can say, oh, no, Bob, you're going to give them to her. <laughs> mediator doesn't have that type of control. Right. Two attorneys representing those parties can have that conversation. But Bob's, you, you've you already mentioned this, Bob's attorney has a rough job because Bob's attorney is going to go, oh, Bob, yeah, the law says actually, you got to give her those bank statements. Right. And when Bob refuses, like that case we were talking about earlier, then Bob's attorney probably will take a walk. Right. Right. Um, are we not allowed to say who that case is? Because it's, I don't know. I, mean, I, pretty, you know, I think pretty, we all know. I'm pretty sure we know. <laughs> I've talked about it in my headlines episode for like the last four months. So <laughs> hard to miss this one. And it's hard to yeah. miss. Yeah. The consulting attorneys, like your coach in the ring, right? Who you're going to like, who's going to be like, no, this is the play you're going to do next because this is how this works or this is what you're entitled to, whatever. And then you get back in the ring with the referee and, right. You know, oh, I love it. If it's boxing, it's a boxing metaphor now, right? So <laughs> we went from fishing to boxing, but it's perfect. Yep. yep. Right. Yep. And then, well, and-, and keep in mind, your attorney can either be helping you outside the process in the corner, yep. so to speak, uh-huh. blotting your forehead and sprinkling water in your mouth, or they can actually get in the ring with you. Right. Right. And they can exactly. come to your mediation sessions. Mm-hmm. And sometimes with a high conflict personality involved, that that will be a part of it. And the other thing, I don't want to lose track of one thing for people because, and Bill Eddy will say the same thing. He actually does a high conflict mediation training for us and, and um, it's wonderful. But one of the things that's, you know, I really want to set expectations for people. Mediation is actually usually a faster process than litigation to get divorced. Right. But when you are, mediating or litigating with a high conflict person, it is tiny, small, little steps. I'm so glad you said that. I'm so glad you said that because I have people who are like, we've been mediating for like, for, you know, forever. And, you know, you, you like, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And you want it to be right because you want to cover the minutia. Yep. You want to make sure that like your ass is covered in like in detail. It and it's, you know, as an example, talk going back to your disclosure issue, if you spend an entire two-hour session of a mediation, but at the end you get a year's worth of bank statements or whatever, he an agree, it's something, some movement forward, and that's it, that's all you accomplished. That's actor actually a victory in a high conflict mediation. Yeah. And and it's frustrating, but anyone who thinks it's going to move faster in a court system is actually, I know it seems like it should. Reality says it does not because they have more ability to delay things in a courtroom. Yeah, Unbelievably. 
I I mean, it really, okay. So, so I want to actually then move on to this next question, which is that, uh, which is about the delays, right? You have people who are delaying and delaying and delaying. And meanwhile, you're paying through the nose for your attorney while they're, you know, setting motions for this or motions for that or delaying or just, just not submitting paperwork. Like, is there a timeline? Is there a time at which you, your attorney files a motion to compel? Is there a time at which, like, what do you do when you're, when you're soon to be X or like long to be X in this case is not, is just dragging their feet because, and, and they're probably doing it because they know it's making you crazy, right? They're, uh, they're, they're, well, it's a war of attrition, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. They know it's depleting your assets. They know it's costing a lot of money. They know it's depleting your emotional resources. Um, I always say no one knows better than your spouse, how to push your button. So whatever's going to get to you, they, they, you know, every weapon will come out. Um, you know, so yes, I mean, the, the one thing that the court system has are deadlines, purported deadlines. And everyone who's out there listening right now is laughing, right? Because they're like, well, sure there's deadlines, but no one ever pays any attention. No one enforces them. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's true. I, I'm not going to, hello, attorney, practice for 26 years in the court systems. Yes, continuances happen continually. Um, people have excuses. The attorneys, you know, have busy practices. Sometimes they need the continuance. Something doesn't happen. And a busy judge says, okay, I'll give you another six weeks to do that. The ball keeps getting punted down the field rather than it finally ever being dealt with. And you can see that in the Kim Kardashian and Kanye West case that we've been alluding to. Alluding to. to. <laughs> you know, so let's just get down to brass tacks and let's talk just, about it, right? Right. That case is likely coming to a head in December because it has a trial date finally. Mm-hmm. And the judge has kind of indicated that either this case settles or this case goes to trial. He's on his sixth attorney I'm not going to punt this ball anymore. Six times is enough, right? Because every time a new attorney comes in, it delays everything. Right, right. Um, And at a certain point in time, if someone hasn't provided information in a courtroom that they were supposed to, then the court is allowed to take a negative inference from that as evidence, right? Like you were supposed to give three years of bank statements. You didn't do it. Since you didn't do it, we're going to presume whatever your wife has to say about the finances is the truth because you're not setting it up in another way. Is that always helpful? Not always, but it, there, there are certain final, like we can finally move forward, but the court system being an overburdened, underpaid, overworked system. If you give a jurist, a, a judge, a, a, an option to punt down the road, they're usually going to take it. No. Yep. And they don't, to go back to what we talked about at the very beginning, they don't always have the answers to dealing with these people either. And don't always recognize what's happening because we in a courtroom, see people come in all the time, spouting all kinds of bad things about each other every single day over and over and over again. I have spent so many hours in courtrooms. I can't begin to tell you over my 30 plus years. And you don't know, the judges don't know who's telling the truth, right? It's, it's, it's hard work yeah. to be that person. Yeah. Yeah. Cause they're just coming in at the end, right? They haven't been there all along and they don't, they don't know, you know, his tells or whatever. Right. They're- right. And yeah, well, and their hands are tied by the law as well, right? Their hands are tied by evidentiary rules and, you know, what the laws and regulations for that court say. So, you know, things like evidence, you want to come in and tell the whole story about what your ex did and you know about it because your best friend saw them at the grocery store, but your best friend's not there to talk about how he was dragging the kids down the hallway in the grocery store that's hearsay. It's not going to come in. And so your evidence is not appropriate. And so judges are hampered. In, and so we're attorneys hampered in that sense. We only have certain tools to get information into the court. Yeah. So it's, it, it's 
there's no perfect system on either side of the fence. Right. Um, you just gain more control and retain more control if you can keep it in a mediated setting. Yeah. Narcissists, okay. especially, but high conflict people tend to use the legal system and its flaws to their benefit. And now for a quick word from our sponsor, the all new fully revised, should I stay or should I go? After three years of this program existing in the world and changing women's lives, I decided to give it a full makeover. The all new version has all new videos, a podcast like audio stream if you wanna take the work on the go, and completely updated resources for deepening your learning. The program consists of six core modules. The first of which is, who are you? This is the section in which you dig deeply into your own personal development and get in touch with your inner guide, slay your inner critics, mine for values, and learn how to set healthy boundaries. The second module is how you learn to love and helps you understand your attachment style, love languages, and how to properly love and care for the most important person in all of this, yourself. Module three is called, Why Are Women So Exhausted? And breaks down some of the issues around toxic masculinity and male entitlement, the myth of being a stay-at-home mom, and answers the question, he's fine, why can't I just be happy? Module four is all about understanding abuse, and includes videos on trauma bonds, understanding the cycles of abuse, particularly how they play out in your own relationship, and addresses addiction, infidelity, and mental illness. Module 5 is all about healing and moving forward and includes videos about therapy, couples therapy, healing from betrayal, emotional regulation, and grief. This section also includes my 90-minute workshop, Tackling Codependence, as well as my signature relationship inventory that will help you gain complete clarity on all the parts of your marriage and figure out what's his and what's yours. And module six answers the question, is the grass really greener on the other side? With in-depth videos on dating, cultural and religious isolation, and what happens if you end up alone forever? Spoiler, you probably won't. Whether you decide to stay or go, this program will set you up for a lifetime of clarity and fulfillment. And if you've already decided to go, the program will help you unpack all that's happened and help you heal so that you can move forward without repeating the same mistakes that got you here in the first place. This program is priced super low at just $697. And if you use the code PODCAST, when you check out, you'll get $50 off the full price. What are you waiting for? You have been agonizing with this decision for long enough. It's time to finally know, should you stay or should you go? And now back to our episode. Okay, I'm going to move on to another question. I've seen this a lot. We get to the end of mediation, the very end. We're about to sign. And they're like, no, I'm not doing it. I don't agree with this. So common. So, so, so common. If you actually, if you talk to Bill Eddy, that he, this is like his, the final day of the training is all about this happening Uh, because, uh, because what were you talking about earlier, Kate, with your fishing pole? Right. Right. Those papers get signed. The the fishing pole goes away. Right. They don't have any power over you anymore. Once that's get signed. That's right. It is. It's a power move. It's, it's like, Oh, you thought this was over, (laughs) right? And, or if I sign this, then my power and control over you goes away. I'm not giving that up. Right. And so what, what, what does, what happens from a legal perspective at that point or immediate from a mediator's perspective at that point? So for a mediator, it signals a back to the table. What are the issues? What do we still need to talk about? There's a conversation that I have, you know, that's more effective with people who um, operate within certain value systems and ethical boundaries where I say, you know, when you renege on an agreement, 
you detract from integrity and trust. And so, you know, something I am always talking about with people in mediation is don't agree to something unless you're going to be able to live, live up to that obligation. Um, so it signals a return to the table, you know, mediation, as long as, you know, we kind of look at it as a day in mediation is a day out of court. Um, and if you are close to being done, it's generally usually worth continuing to try and get all the holes closed because the other thing we know about high conflict people is it's never over. No, it's never over. So it's never <laughs> over. Uh, the other things that can be done are, are some states allow bifurcations. Actually, Kim and Kanye bifurcated their case. Mm-hmm. Uh, they went ahead and she asked for a legal divorce. So they are divorced, but they're still um, going through some of the issues, uh, the financial and parenting issues. But you can bifurcate the issues as well. You can have what they will agree to entered as a court order in some cases. So, well, Bob, I hear you saying that, you know, you now think the house should be sold. Is there anything else that though still is, is durable in what you had agreed to or what we thought had been created? Yeah. Um, is the child support, is the parenting plan, is something in a place where we can put that before a court and try to keep it moving forward? Okay. So you can kind of, you can pull things out and have the, have the judge rule on those things. So that is now set. And then we're going to do this and that will be set. And so you can can pull it apart like that. It's not ideal because a lot of these pieces can be intertwined, but nailing down an agreement can be worth taking things out of order like that. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's difficult, you know, and, and again, I, I hate to say this cause I know everyone wants the magic bullet or the, the special formula and, you know, divorce is you'll hear it on all of our shows. Divorce is hard, but divorce with a high conflict person is a whole different kind of purgatory. Yeah, it is, but it's better than marriage to an abuser. So <laughs> Like a hundred percent, right? You, you can't, you know, I always say like, you can't heal a trauma that you're still living in. So please don't hear this and say, oh, well then I guess I shouldn't divorce him because it's going to, you know, it'll just be worse. It's going to be different, but, um, but you'll, if you'll, if you get some separation, you'll actually begin to be able to begin to heal. Um, and then you're going to take that healed self into mediation or into the courtroom and, and, you know, but if you stay married, you're, you're, you don't get a chance to heal. No. And, and by the way, your children don't get the benefit of a parent who has had the opportunity to heal or even start healing. And I do want to say one thing, because I think this is really important for those who are listening, your, your audience in particular, Kate. If you are going through a high conflict divorce, a skilled and knowledgeable divorce coach who knows what they're talking about. Well, and I'm, I mean this very truly. I, I, I'm not saying this for who I'm talking to you, but you know how strongly I believe this. Yeah. I actually, when I was mediating and doing high conflict divorce mediations, I would not take the case if the person who was the lesser conflict person yeah. did not have a coach. Oh wow. Because you need that guide yep. to help you to understand what is going on in a way that your mediator cannot be. I cannot turn to Mary as a mediator and say, "Mary, the reason I'm not yelling at Bob right now that he's being completely unreasonable and and you know, this that or whatever you want me to be saying to him is because the minute I do that as the neutral mediator, we have lost Bob. Right. But Mary needs to hear that sort of thing from someone right. who has to understand the fine line that their neutral is playing. We have to keep the high conflict person at the table. Right. And so we can we can manage them, but we can't be your warrior. We can't, that is not our role. And you can't even say why you're not being our warrior. 
(laughs) Because that is, I can never say that in that conversation, a good divorce coach will have already prepared their client for that before they ever get to the mediation. And then all the nuances of that long path through the mediation process are things that a, a, a truly skilled coach is going to be able to help you with, not to mention what you just talked about, about healing. Many people wait until the divorce is done to start trying to work through their trauma and healing. And you are actually, I know you've got a lot on your plate, but the sooner you start that process, in fact, start it before you start the mediation, if you can, the better for all of you. Yep. You need your strength. And it, and it really does come down to, this is that marathon. This is, we, we say it's, it's so trite. Oh, it's a, it's a marathon, not a race. Yeah. Yeah. But it's so true. It is so true. You need your stamina. You need your support team. Yep. Figure out the best way you can to have them. I just had uh, this week, Tina Swithin on talking about her updated version of one mom's battle. Mm. And I have to say in that book, the thing that jumped out at me is this is a woman who went through a 10 year court battle 10 years, 10 years. And I don't, I hate using this phrase when it comes to narcissists, but I I will use it here. She won. She got sole custody. She had his parental rights terminated and they were adopted by her current husband. I've never heard of that. And she did it while representing herself for the most part. Yeah. If you, for those who can't see my, my head just exploded. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's unbelievable, but one of her biggest gifts, she had several, but was her patience and her tenacity. So Tina like represented herself. She hired an attorney to coach her outside of court, but she went to court for the most part on her own. She found a private investigator and she stuck to her guns for 10 years. 10 years, 10 years, y'all. I mean, it's really unbelievable. The thing about Tina is like, we don't want to give people the, I, the, the false hope that like, oh, well, if I, if I just represent myself or I do whatever, then I'm going to get that too. Because, because you're, you're probably not. Um, as Susan said, she's never heard that having someone's parental rights terminated is almost impossible. And the reasons that Tina did it were egregious enough that it was worth a 10 year battle to be able to do that. You know, there are high conflict personalities and then there are people who are like dangerous psychopaths, (laughs) sociopaths and psycho. Yes. Yeah. And, and yeah, I I thank you because I do not, I, that's why I don't ever use the words you can beat a narcissist or you can how to go divorce a narcissist and win. I see those headlines and I shiver because they give people, first of all, it puts you in a mindset where you're in a battle and just starts that conflict cycle Uh going again. Really Uh the best you're ever going to hope for with a high conflict person is that you're going to learn all of their patterns of misbehavior, and you're going to have tools to deflect them from interfering as much as possible in your life. Yes. Things like Biff. Right. right? And that's so great, right? This long drawn out battle just gives, and this is one of the reasons we, Susan and I don't advocate for like rushing, diving in and rushing your divorce and getting it done really quickly because you learn a thing or two, like as this, you know, your parenting plan, I always say like, take a long ass time to make your parenting plan because because your, your soon to be ex is going to reveal all the cracks that you need to fill with the parenting plan. Right? Absolutely. They're going to yeah. they're gonna show up late and you're going to be like, oh, okay, so what do we do if they show up late? Make a note of that. They're going to, you know, drive drunk. Oh, okay. Apparently we need to put sober link in our, in our parenting plan. Right. But if you had your parenting plan ready to go in the first week, you don't have, you don't have access to all of this information that's revealed over time. Right. right. And I, I love how you phrase that, Kate, because they do. There's the, 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 the wonderful thing, <laughs> if you can say this about high conflict people and narcissists is that they are very repetitive in their patterns of behavior. They're very predictable. And, when once you yeah. figure it out, you're like, well, and also, and they're very, they're very predictable. Once we like, we know, 
Like, right. you know, we have, because I've, because I see it over and over and over and over again. I'm like, okay, well, they're probably going to do this next. And then my clients are like, I can't believe you called that. He totally did that. And I'm like, yeah, of course he did. <laughs> they're all, they're all the same. It's amazing. <laughs> Well, and that's why you can, you know, you, that's why a book like Bill's books, um, splitting or some of his other, you know, books, uh, we have friends who have written books. I mean, you know, that's why those can actually be really, really helpful. Yes. But what you need to do is take what's in there and actually start watching what you're X is doing yes. and taking note of it yep. because you will see patterns in it and you will see things that you're like, Oh, you know what? This is when he's going to start telling me that I'm making it all up. Or this is where he's going to start saying, I'm the one who showed up late for the, the drop-off or, you know, all the different, the gaslighting and the, uh-huh. the trans, you know, transference, all the different things they're going to do because yeah. they do them. All of them. Yeah. Yes. All of them. Always knowing what they're doing and then having a skill set to know how to respond to it or not respond. Right. Biff is a way to respond, but Bill even will say, sometimes you just don't respond at all. Respond. You don't respond. And you're like, that sucks the air, right? This is the, the air that they breathe. And you're just like, you're swimming by that hook. And they're like, wait, what, why, why do I not have a fish on my line? What's going on here? It's always worked before. That's right. And I think it's a, you know, one of the things that's really hard for people to wrap their head around, right, is that narcissists, high conflict people, abusers, whatever we want to call them, there's a whole laundry list. Um, they are very strategic in in their sort of power plays. And it's really hard for someone, especially an empath or and or a highly sensitive person who are usually the victims of these people, it's really hard for us to wrap our brain around strategy, like that I have to strategize with this person, like, because we don't come from that mindset with that's it. But, but these people operate very differently in the world from the way we do. And the most dangerous thing that we can do is assume that they operate like we do. And so we have to get into a more strategic mindset when communicating with someone like this, um, which is hard for us to do, but it, but, but it's, it's necessary, right? Because we try to implore, we're like, we try to sort of, you know, appeal to their empathy or, but they don't have it. No, they don't have it. Right. We try to, you know, beg them to just, but why would you do this when our kids and blah, blah, they don't care. They're just trying to win you know, to, right. right. They're yep. trying to win. Yeah. And that's all that matters uh-huh. really. That's and right. yeah, this goes back to what we talked about a little bit earlier, where, you know, I was saying that we think they're coming to mediation for the reasons that we are coming to mediation. Exactly. Um, exactly. and it, and it's just not And the hard part for people. I, I really think it's important for people to grasp what you're saying here is, you know, that, they see your empathy or your emotions as a tool to use against you. It's a weapon that they can use against you and they know how, right? They are very skilled at it. And this is, you're not their first time at this rodeo in most cases, right? Your narcissist didn't just suddenly become one when they met you. Right, right. And so they, they know in general how to manipulate people. And, and they are, I, this strategy aspect is something that is very, very difficult for people. And this is just another reason why you need a coach and why you need some support. That's right. Because as you said, you tell someone, oh, they did this, then be on the lookout for this. And then the next conversation you have is, and when they do that, Here's what you do. Here's what you're going to do. I mean, I, right. I, it's like, I have it, I have it all laid out because Lord knows I've (laughs) seen it a million times, right. We've seen it over and over and over and over again. Um, you know, and you have to remember that a narcissist, one of the hallmarks of a narcissist, just so we, so we sort of cover that base is that they 
behave similarly in all circumstances because this is a fundamental part of who they are, right? So a narcissist will have this exact conflict in their work relationships with their bosses, you know, at the at Starbucks, right? They're they're very consistent in their behavior. Um, an abuser who's more, you know, sociopathic, they know when to turn it on and turn it off. And neither is somebody that you want to go up against in court because they both, they all, but all have the same thing in common, which is that they lack empathy <laughs> um, and they're grandiose and they're in it for themselves. Right. So, um, and a few other things you were saying like, you know, this isn't their first time at the rodeo. Like, absolutely not. They've, they've been doing this. All of them have been doing this for years, their whole lives. And usually successfully for some period of time. Right. Because if you're divorcing them, you were married to them for long enough that they was successful for a while. And they've probably had other relationships and they've probably had other jobs. I mean, some people figure them out faster, but this is usually, we we say they have repetitive behaviors. They have repetitive relationships throughout their lives that, that go down these roads. And I'm, you know, I don't want to hundred percent villainize here. I, you know, people become, you know, what, what they are, you, you know, narcissists, usually it's a childhood trauma yes. Yes. that has, has led to this awful things very often. But unfortunately what it leads to is a person who does not have the same moral boundaries as you do. That's right. So something like lying to achieve their ends is that you would never do is absolutely within fair game for them. And in fact, is a very common tool. What happens is because we know that, you know, oh, but he had such a horrible childhood. Oh, but he has all this trauma, right? We begin to have, we have more compassion for what created the narcissism because narcissists are usually made, not born. um, Mm -hmm. And they're made by their trauma. And so we have more compassion for the trauma that they endured than we do for ourselves, for the trauma that we are, that we are enduring repeatedly and repeatedly and repeatedly. Right. We got to switch that around, right? Yes. We can have empathy and compassion for their wounding while also taking care of ourselves. And that's actually sort of that magic place yes. that's so very hard to get to. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, we've talked about Kanye West and, and Kim Kardashian. I do want to note yes. you know, that we have no idea whether he's ever been diagnosed as a narcissist or any other, but we do know he's been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Right. That is not a trauma uh, based disorder. That is a chemical imbalance and, and neurobiological disorder that he has you know, no choice in having that. Um, unfortunately it, it can also lead to, I've seen, you know, I've have dealt with many bipolar cases in where someone is suffering or struggling with bipolar disorder. That is a very intractable disease that leads to a lot of behaviors that are very, very similar to narcissists yes. and sociopaths. Yes, that's right. Um, and while he doesn't have a choice, in having this, um, he does have a choice about now, and that's possibly debatable about, about being met, about medicating, about taking his med. Right. Um, yep. he has chosen not to quite deliberately. And we could say it's the disease that makes him not do it. Right. And so is right. that choice or not choice, but, but at the end of the day, Kim Kardashian could have and I see it all the time in my group, all the compassion he's got, but he's bipolar. And I, you know, I don't want to take the kids away from him, blah, 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 blah. But the man is unsafe. When he is in a manic episode, he is unsafe. And so you can't, like, it can't be both, right? We can have compassion for him and also protect our children. And the boundaries. And that's where, right. that's why I say it's the golden, you know, sort of that golden middle of understanding. You can still be you and have, be a compassionate person, but you have to put up the guardrails that's right. and understand what you're, you're dealing with. And I, I put it into place. I, you mentioned Soberlink earlier. And, you know, the thing I've always said with alcohol and dr- substance abuse disorders as well, is they're more along the lines of, bipolar disorder than they, than narcissism or sociopathy, um, in that you may not have a choice in being an addict, 
a person with a substance mm-hmm. abuse disorder. But once you know you have it, at least legally, the way the court system looks at it is you have the ability to make a choice for sobriety. That's right. Just wrote that in my book. <laughs> oh, I can't right. wait to read that book. Once, once you know, like then, you know, you have to, you have to handle it. But one of the other thing I'll say is that many states have failure to protect laws. Um, Oklahoma has the worst ones and will sometimes there are women that who have been incarcerated for life for failing to protect their children from their abusive spouse, partner, whatever, even though they were the victims themselves of the same abuse. And the reason that women, you know, it's like, it's like, why don't they leave on steroids? It's, oh, you didn't leave. And your children got abused because you were being abused and, you know, your head is completely twisted um, by the abuse, but you didn't leave, you didn't protect your children. So you're going to jail for longer than the abuser. The reason I say that, right, is that if your spouse, if you have so much compassion for your spouse that you're either staying with them or you're not protecting your children because, oh, but he's just sick and it's his childhood wounding and blah, 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 blah. You could actually be liable for that. Depending on what backwards state you live in. I I have never practiced law in one of those states. Yes, Oklahoma, we love you. But that's, you know, that's the opposite of a state like Connecticut in California. You know, California is, you know, Caden's Law. Connecticut just added coercive control to their definition of abuse in a a relationship. Yes. the polar opposite. We are getting somewhere with that. We're getting somewhere. We are, thanks to the work of like Dr. Christine Kokila and, and, you know, some of our favorite guests. But unfortunately, we live in a world that does not understand abuse, domestic abuse, domestic violence, coercive control, whatever we want to call it in this intimate partner, abuse and violence. To blame someone for their own abuse and for the abuse of the children, as opposed to the perpetrator of the abuse, it puts us in a world where, but where abortions no longer, right? So it's like stepping backwards in the world. Yeah. You know, we're stepping backwards in, in time. And that is a ass backwards way of looking at things and that those laws are still on the books in some of our States is scary. It's horrific, but it is the reality. It's the reality and, and it's the reality that we are in a dangerous, uh, slippery slope towards women's rights, just being, you know, whittled away and poof. So on that note, Susan, (laughs) (laughs) you guys all know that Susan and I have an Instagram account called fuck those fuckers. (laughs) And I believe the Instagram account to get it by Instagram is actually F F those those efforts. efforts. Right. (laughs) (laughs) You'll find it every once in a while. We get really mad and we post shit on there. Uh, I got to tell you, it's just my cathartic like outlet. I go there and I post things and I'm like, you know, anything bad happens to Trump. And I'm like, yay. Oh my God. That's another episode. Speaking of, yes. speaking of high conflict narcissists, um, <laughs> sociopaths uh, who do the same thing over and over, same thing over and over and keep getting away with it. <sighs> All right. Susan, thank you so, so, so much. Um, everyone don't forget, you know, Susan has her amazing podcast divorce and beyond go check that out. Um, if you don't already, I mean, I'm pretty sure we basically share the same audience. (laughs) I love you. And where else can people find you? You know, the best place these days is at the training Academy, Mostyn And, uh, if you are a professional out there and want to start adding to your toolbox, including that high conflict mediation training with Bill Eddy, come on over and check out the website. We have a lot of amazing trainings to help you help the people that we're, we're talking to on these show, our shows. Yes. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Kate. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Divorce Survival Guide podcast. If you like what you hear, head on over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen in and leave me a review. And don't forget to follow me on Instagram at the Divorce Survival Guide. I'll see you next time. And until then, remember, you, my love, deserve to be happy.